good morning. I'm Courtney Wheaton, the Public Information Officer for the Department of Neighborhoods and your host for the 2023 Neighborhood Best Practices Conference. Thank you for joining us early on a Saturday morning, especially before the holiday. You could be holiday shopping, but you're here with us, so thank you so much for being here. That being said, we are so excited to have you here. We have an impactful and engaging program designed with you and your needs in mind. Now, let's also take a moment to thank Joni Kalem for providing our musical entertainment this morning. Now, to get us started, I would like to introduce my boss and the director of the Department of Neighborhoods, Carla Williams Scott. Thank you, Courtney, and good morning, everyone. And again, I echo Courtney's sentiment, and thank you all for being here with us. So I know you could be anywhere else on a Saturday morning. So we appreciate you joining us here. Um, we believe that the information that you receive today will be both informative and thoughtful and provo um, thought provoking. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank all of the individuals that have had a hand in planning today's conference. My Department of Neighborhoods team members, all of our presenters, volunteers, and partner organizations for sharing your resources today. Thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Can we give them a round of applause? Our theme this year is Stronger Together, Building Healthy, Equitable, and Resilient Neighborhoods. This sets the tone for today, and we believe that events like this are important because we know neighborhoods are stronger when everyone is engaged and involved. By attending today, you will have the opportunity to learn and reflect on new ideas that you can take back to your community and put into practice. We also know that at the core of every great city, are vibrant and diverse neighborhoods, driven by caring, committed, and passionate residents, all of you who are here in this room today. <clears throat> I see this every day in our work at the Department of Neighborhoods. But we also know that some of our neighborhoods and residents have not always shared in the success and growth of this city. I'm honored to work with and for a mayor that believes all of our residents deserve to live in safe, healthy neighborhoods, and has committed resources, both human and financial, to ensure that we are able to work toward this goal. Unfortunately, the mayor could not be here with us today, but sends uh, his message to all of the neighborhood residents that are working here. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your commitment. As you know, his top three priorities are neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods. We also know that it can be stressful as neighborhood leaders to navigate issues of growth and development. The sessions today are designed to help enhance the work that you are doing to create healthy and thriving neighborhoods. Together, we will have the opportunity to discuss the importance of resiliency mental and, and mental and physical health. You will also be introduced to city programs and resources that are helping us to grow equitably. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Mashika Roberts. <laughs> Dr. Roberts serves as the health commissioner for the city of Columbus. She has a prolific public health background working at, state, at both state, local, and national levels. As, a health, as health commissioner, she leads a team of more than 500 public health professionals who are focused on neighborhood-based approaches that address the social determinants of health and remove disparities. Many of her team members are here with us today, so not only is she serving as our keynote, but her team members are supporting as well. So can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Dr. Roberts and her team created the Center for Public Health Innovation, where they focus on healthy neighborhoods and health equity. I just wanted to share this information from their website because I think it puts into perspective today's conference and the work that we're trying to do in our neighborhoods. It says, not everyone in Columbus has the same opportunities to be healthy. We see differences in health based on race, ethnicity, sex, neighborhood, income, education, 
sexual orientation, gender identity, and other factors. Research has shown that the neighborhood you live in, your access to quality housing, a good job, and a good education have a greater impact on your health than do genetics or access to care. Columbus Public Health works to address the, the root causes of health inequities and, and create opportunities for all people to be healthy. Leading this effort in the health, is the health equity section of Columbus Public Health, health, which includes programs such as neighborhood social work, LGBTQ health initiative, and health equity promotion. Dr. Roberts is a passionate health professional and our community is better for having her here. It is my pleasure to introduce our health commissioner and my friend, Dr. Mashika Roberts. Well, good morning. How is everyone doing on this um, not too chilly and fortunately not raining Saturday morning? It's good to see all of you here this morning. Um, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to be the keynote speaker for this conference. Um, when Director William Scott called me and asked me if I could do it, I said, of course, I'll do anything for you. Um, and then when she told me the date was December 2nd, I was like, of course, I'll do anything for you. Um, but I'm here and I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see all of you and I'm happy to have my team here. You're gonna hear more about some of our programming and our breakout sessions with some of my team, um, my colleagues are going to be leading. Um, but I'm hoping that what I can convey to you this morning is really just going a little deeper than what Director William Scott said about why neighborhoods matter. Um, and the social determinants of health and some great work that we are starting to do at Columbus Public Health to try to change the trajectory, particularly of our future, our young kids and our community. So again, I'm honored to be here and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the social determinants of health and redlining and why our neighborhoods look the way they do today. So. Let's see if this works. So first, let's go back a little bit um, to pre-pandemic. I know it might be hard for people to remember what life was like before we had this virus. I'm just grateful that I'm not standing up here talking about COVID. Um, but pre-March of 2020, it was actually February 14th, if I'm not mistaken, at the mayor's state of the city, he declared racism a public health crisis. And again, this was before the pandemic, before the world saw the disparities that occur in health between blacks and whites or minorities and majorities. And we knew this at public health, but really the pandemic and COVID-19 ripped the Band-Aid off of that issue because it allowed the world to see that the majority population had access they were healthier going into the pandemic, not only, not only health-wise healthier, but they were financially healthier. They had you know, savings account, they had jobs that allowed them to work from home, um, whereas many in the minority populations didn't have that advantage. So he declared racism a public health crisis, and as a result of that, um, about two months after that declaration, we opened and started the Center for Public Health Innovation, and you heard Director William Scott say a little bit about some of the work that we do at the Center for Public Health Innovation. But what we know in this country, despite the fact that slavery ended many, many years ago, is that African Americans today, as I stand here, are subject to more disparities in health, in access to services, in access to jobs, and that is a ripple effect that then affects where they live, how they survive, how they thrive. And what I really want to convey to all of you, and I think you know this, but you cannot thrive if you don't have good health. And if you don't have good health and you're not thriving, you cannot work with our community, your neighborhood, to allow our city or your neighborhood, your block, to thrive and grow. So we need that basic foundation of good health in order to allow all of us to thrive. So 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about redlining. And I'm going to go back to January of this year. So show of hands, has anyone seen the exhibit Undesign the Red Line? Great. Several of you have seen it in here. So Undesign the Red Line is a national exhibit that communities can bring to their cities, like Columbus, and make it very specific to what redlining looked like in their city. So this was a joint effort between the YWCA and I think the City Department of Development brought this exhibit to Columbus, Ohio. I think it arrived in the fall of 2022, and then in 2023, it, it expanded to some areas. So I took my leadership team to see this exhibit in January of this year. And my leadership team, I'm proud to say, is relatively diverse. So we have six, there are six individuals that I took with me. Of those six individuals, four are African-American, um, two Caucasians. I have one from the LGBTQ population. I have one that lives in the suburbs, no offense, Delaware County, so out there. Um, and then of the six of us, Three are natives of Columbus, Ohio. And when I tell you that we were all moved by that exhibit and learned so much that we didn't understand of why our community looks the way it looks today. And I was one of those. So, you know, I had this misbelief that redlining was like, oh, if you, you couldn't buy a house, you had to pay cash is what I had this misnomer about. What I didn't realize is redlining was so intentional that low, well, not even low income, minority populations be, based on the color of your skin were challenged to buy property. And so if you lived and wanted to buy a property in a certain part of town that was not redlined, you could get what we know now as a traditional mortgage where you'd put about 20% down and you'd have an interest rate, let's say, I think the average interest rate right now is 8%. But if you lived in one of these red line neighborhoods, they said, oh, you can buy a house. But you, to buy a house in this neighborhood where you feel comfortable, where your friends and family live, you now have to put 50% down. Imagine that, 50% down. And your interest rate isn't 8%. No, your interest rate is going to be 25%. So who could afford to buy a house? So in essence, they were saying you can't buy a house, right? Because they were putting so many obstacles in your way that prevented you from buying a house. So then imagine, as a result of that, there were people in those neighborhoods who weren't able to buy the homes that they were living in. And as a result of that, those houses, the condition of those houses started to go down because they didn't have the resources or the desire to keep it up because it wasn't theirs. And then as a result of that, infrastructure didn't come into the neighborhoods, whether it be grocery stores, quality schools, good sidewalks, lighting, transportation, all the things that we call in health the social determinants of health all the things we need. And without those resources, there weren't jobs there in their neighborhoods. And so when we look at our neighborhoods today that are not thriving, these are some of the same neighborhoods that were redlined back in 1936. So um, that really drove me to say, we've got to do something from a health perspective about this. Like I know the mayor talks about neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods. And I know that we have the Center for Public Health Innovation and we're addressing racism. But I wanna do something bold. I wanna do something to help these neighborhoods, but most importantly, help the kids growing up in those same neighborhoods, because those kids are our future. So I'm not gonna spill all the beans, because I think there's a breakout session, but I'm gonna touch upon the um, announcement that we made in August, really, that stemmed from um, redlining. So this is a map of our city and um, the areas that were redlined. You can see clearly that these neighborhoods are neighborhoods that many of you, many of us live in. 
um, and some of the neighborhoods that we're standing in right now at this point in time. What I think is very interesting, and just a, a somewhat of a side note, the architect, the individual who came up with the idea of redlining, so there were um, neighborhoods that were labeled type A, type B, C, and D. Type A was green, green light, go. Um, it was the better neighborhood. And then um, there were type D neighborhoods, which is where the redlined areas were. But the architect behind this is actually a Columbus native. Who knew? His name is Corwin Fergus. He actually attended The Ohio State University. And he created this idea to the federal government. And they used it in over 200 cities across the country. Columbus was not alone. Um, and so we have one of our own to thank for how our cities, not only here in Columbus, but really across the um, United States look. So this was um, really the federal government's way of socially engineering who lived in what neighborhoods and what neighborhoods looked like. And I have no idea if they thought in 1936 that what they did was going to have an impact so many years later. So we fast forward to the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that changed that and basically um, changed the um, homeowners, loan corporate, homeowners Loan Corporation, which was the program that they used to create the redlining, so the type A through D neighborhoods. So as a result of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, that was lifted, but we still haven't recovered from that. So as I said, health is more than health care, right? There are so many things outside of our control. Yes, I got up this morning and I got to work out before I came here. I drink a lot of water. I try to eat healthy. But it doesn't change the fact that I live in downtown Columbus. Downtown Columbus is not the same as Delaware County. It's not the same as Clintonville. It's different. And so as a result of that, I have stressors from my neighborhood. I have helicopters flying over me, whether they're going to Grant Hospital or they're going to Nationwide Children's Hospital. I don't have this serene environment. Now, in my case, you can say, well, I chose to live there. But there are many people who did not choose to live in those neighborhoods. And so despite whatever they're doing from a behavior standpoint to help their health, they have environmental issues that negatively impact their health. Those are called the social determinants of health. So I love this tree um, because I think it's really a great visual depiction of what happens when you don't have good roots. So if you look at the tree, I gotta make sure I'm orienting myself right. On your right, that tree looks really inviting. If it were nice weather outside, you might wanna sit under that tree, have a cup of coffee, read a book, and enjoy the beautiful day and the birds chirping. But that tree on your left, it does not look desirable. And so let's look at the roots of those trees. So when we look at the roots of the undesirable tree, we have adverse living conditions, unsafe neighborhoods, poverty, segregation, and unemployment. Again, the roots, the base. Then we have fragmented, sub, sub, ugh, fragmented systems, a sense of powerlessness, and disconnected members in the neighborhood or in the community. And as a result of that base, those roots being so... Um, undesirable and not having the proper structure in nutrition, we see increasing HIV AIDS numbers, high numbers of infant mortality, high numbers of smoking, malnutrition, and obesity. But on that other tree that looks so inviting, in the roots we see jobs, likely jobs with benefits, likely jobs with sick time, we see access to healthy foods, we see quality housing, adequate incomes, and safe neighborhoods. We see a root of that tree that has strong leadership, political influence, sense of community, and social networks. And then all those other ills that you see in the tree on the right 
are shrunken, they're decreased. And we don't see high numbers of HIV AIDS and infant mortality and obesity and smoking because we've got the great infrastructure. And so I, I want to remind you all, that's what we need you here for. And that's what Columbus Public Health is working with the mayor's office, the Department of Neighborhoods, and all other city departments, because we want all of our neighborhoods to have those strong roots so that we can all flourish and all thrive and all give back to our community and our city. OK, so let's go back to Redline in a little bit. So what I realized after I went to this exhibit and I was so moved and I was like, what can we do? What can we do? So if you don't know, um, we have kids exposed to lead here in the city of Columbus. Now, lead was banned in paint back in the late 70s. But we still have homes that were built way before that that have lead paint in them. And when lead paint chips, and you have little kids in that same home, and they're crawling, or they're putting their hands on the doors and the window seals, and then what do little kids do when, with their hands after they touch things? They put it in their mouth. And so they're ingesting lead. And the symptoms of lead can be very, um, they're very diverse and they can mimic a lot of other things. So you're not going to go to the doctor and automatically say, oh, you have lead poisoning, just like you would if you have strep throat or if a cold or a stomach virus. It, pres it presents like delayed learning, unusual behavior. What, do we, what does that also look like? ADHD and failure to thrive and other things. So we know that lead paint and lead exposure is disproportionately seen in these previously redlined neighborhoods. So why is that? Again, I told you, these were neighborhoods that individuals had multiple obstacles in order to buy the homes. So they didn't invest in those homes they lived in. They didn't care for them. They didn't maintain them. And then when lead paint was, um, when we got rid of lead paint in 1978, they didn't come in and strip the paint, paint over it. They did stopgap measures because they didn't have necessarily the resources. It wasn't a priority for the landlord because they weren't living in the house. Um, so they weren't worried about it. So there's a variety of different things that happen. We know here in the city of Columbus, so kids should be screened for lead at the age of um, one and two at their primary care appointment. Anyone living in the city of Columbus and anyone on Medicaid, really what the state says is anyone on Medicaid, any child on Medicaid should be screened for lead between the ages of one and two at their primary care appointment. And again, around five, um, again, around five. So they should be screened twice in their young childhood. But let's think about it. How many families, particularly living in these neighborhoods, actually go to their well child visit? Right? They usually go to urgent care when the child is sick. Maybe they go to the well child visits once the child turns one, I mean, from their birth to one. But then after that, the child is walking, talking, you know, most of their shots are done with. Um, their vaccines are done with until it's time for them to matriculate into kindergarten. So not all families do that. So it's a missed opportunity for that child to be screened for lead. So we know here in the city of Columbus, we've got about 7,500 individuals, kids under the age of six, who should be screened for lead, particularly those living in those red line areas. So we need to do more because if we look at the data over the last seven to eight years, only about 10% of those kids who should be screened for lead are being screened for lead. Only 10%. And it's an easy test. It's a blood test, okay? It's nothing that intrusive. Now, kids don't like to get blood drawn. I get that. But it's nothing that intrusive. Um, and so when we get those kids screened, um, and you're going to hear about this in the breakout session from my colleague Luke, um, if they're elevated, 
they come to us at the health department and it's our responsibility to investigate the home that they live in or where they spend a lot of their time. It could be their home, it could be their child care center, it could be grandma, grandpa, or aunt's home. And that's our responsibility as public health to do that. So let me move forward because I know I'm running out of time. I'm getting on a tangent. So I told you about the different symptoms that um, individuals can have with lead poisoning. So here on this slide, you can kind of see some of the things that we see um, as a result of high levels of lead poisoning. We see a drop in IQ level. We see individuals having trouble with that third grade reading proficiency test. We also see the, a decrease in the number of gifted children. We see a lot of antisocial behavior. And guess what? This antisocial behavior can lead to violent behavior. So then you think about the violence we see in our community, and where do we see it? Red line neighborhoods, previously red line neighborhoods. And then obviously with um, antisocial behavior and maybe violent behavior, we see an increase in incarceration. So these are things that we need to be concerned about. And there is no safe amount of lead, okay? The state has a level of 3.5 that they want us to do an investigation on, but there is no safe level of lead. So I told you that we were only testing about 10% of the kids who were eligible. In the last eight years, um, there's an average of 141 kids each year that have an elevated lead level. Now, none of you probably knew that, but you probably did know that we have about 150 babies every year who die before their first birthday because we've done a great job of talking about infant mortality and informing the community of the dangers of that. We haven't done a good job of talking about lead and lead exposure and lead risk in our community. And I told you, um, uh, when you look at the ages of one to two, only about 50% have been tested. And before I told you 10% when you look at all the kids between the ages of zero and six. So what we've been doing thus far is testing the kids. So the kids are serving as a canary in the coal mine. We're not trying to be proactive. We're not trying to get rid of the lead that is in their homes. We're just waiting to see if they're ever going to have elevated levels, and then we're going to intervene. We've got to do better by our kids. So in August, we launched Healthy Children and Safe Homes by 2040. It's our lead-free health equity initiative, and it's going to allow us as a community but led by Columbus Public Health to do better by our kids and to be more proactive and identify more cases of lead, but most importantly, remediate that. So the next family isn't exposed to that and the child is no longer exposed to that. So it's really a four-part a four-part system. Our goal, and it's a very ambitious goal, my, my team um, looked at me like I was crazy, is to have zero lead-infected kids or lead-exposed kids by the year 2040. That's not that far away. I don't know if I'll still be in this position at that point in time, but that's our goal, and we're going to work really hard to get there. We're going to focus on the four areas, which include screening and testing. We've got to do more screening and testing. We can't just wait for a kid to show up to their primary care appointment. We have to be more proactive, go out and find those kids where they are and test them. So places that we're looking at are our WIC clinics. We have babies that come to our WIC clinics with their moms. Let's test them there. We're also going to do more education and outreach because we need more awareness. We need everyone to be aware of what to look for in their home, signs and symptoms to look for. We need to do more workforce development. We do not have enough individuals that live and work in our community who know how to do lead remediation. We have a very small number of experts who know how to do it. And the, the certification isn't that hard to get but it takes money and it takes a little bit of time for someone to do it. So we need to help more people get certified. So it's a great workforce development tool. And then we're gonna have money in the coffer to help individuals re um, replace windows and doors because um, friction areas like windows and doors is where the paint starts to peel and chip and that's where the kids can start touching that peeling and chipping paint. And so we're gonna have um, resources to help families just remove those, um, just replace those windows and doors. Um, we're gonna be in three pilot neighborhoods. 
We've got to start somewhere. We can't go everywhere. We picked these neighborhoods based on what we knew in terms of the number of children in those areas and the age of the homes in those areas. So the areas we picked are near east in the Livingston Avenue corridor, Greater Linden, and the south side. And again, I think Luke is is gonna talk a little more in detail about this at one of the breakout sessions. So you can see a little bit about the screening. I mentioned we're gonna to go to WIC clinics and we're gonna even start screening at our immunization clinic at the health department because we get a, little, a lot of kids coming in there, but we've got to screen more kids. And we're also working with Nationwide Children's Hospital. We've been working with Nationwide Children's Hospital, but we're gonna continue that work and we're challenging them, what else can you do to help test more kids? I talked about the education and outreach. This not only includes a large community outreach, but also talking to landlords, talking to schools, talking to community partners like many of you in this room, and really doing a communications campaign. And then the workforce development. Um, we need to get more people who know how to do this kind of work. And um, so we're working with um, a lot of uh, workforce development companies and groups in town to help us identify people and get that training out, as well as Department of Neighborhoods and the Department of Development and building and zoning in the city of Columbus. And then I mentioned the window and door repairs um, that we'll be doing as well. So here are the three pilot areas. You know, again, these are the many partners that we're working with. I mentioned these already, um, but we are grateful to work with them and see what we can do, because these children are our future. These children are our future, and they don't deserve to have exposure to lead that can have lifelong impacts on them. Yes, lead can be treated. You can treat lead poisoning, but you it gets in your neurologic system, and even once you remove it with a process called chelating, which probably sounds painful. It's not that painful, but a child shouldn't have to go through that when we know better. And when you know better, you got to do better, right? So it's a bold initiative. Um, we need all hands on deck. We're doing some fundraising to help us. We've got some city dollars, some state dollars, um, but it's, it's a bold move. And um, I'm proud of my team for stepping up for this challenge and doing something with um, our children and our communities who need our help. So just a few more slides about health equity. Everyone has a role to play. You might be sitting in your chair like, well, I'm not um, a public health person. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a child care provider. Um, so what can I do to help reduce some of these disparities and help improve health in our community? So there's something all of us can do. First of all, you can educate yourself. What does health equity mean? And if you are an affluent person, no matter what your color is, you might say, well, this doesn't impact me. But it could impact someone you work with. It could impact someone you go to church with. So educate yourself so you have a better understanding. Ask those you serve. If you're in a service industry, how are they feeling? What do they need? I think there are so many people now who are hungry as a result of what we've been dealing with over the last three years, even though the pandemic is over, there are so many people who are still struggling, struggling. And so asking the question of how can I help you? How can things be better for you? You can inspire and mentor individuals. Make sure I'm on the right page. You can inspire and mentor individuals. I see all these young people in front of us and I appreciate all the efforts they're doing. Grab a young person, even if you don't have children. Grab someone you know, pick them up, ask them how they're doing, ask them what they're interested in their future. And if they don't have an interest, challenge them. Well, what do you like to do? And encourage them that there is a future for them so that they can help themselves and help them, their families. And understand the value and the role that public health plays. I think people all have a better appreciation for public health as a result of the pandemic. But we do so much more than just respond to COVID-19, I assure you. Um, so understand the value of public health and health protection and what you can do to protect your health, what you can do to help improve your health. Be informed and passionate. We're all passionate about something. We should, be we should be passionate about our health and the health of those around us. And then stay engaged. 
And I think all of you here today, is, it's, it's true and it's clear that you are engaged and you want to be engaged, but stay engaged and find a lane that you're comfortable in, whatever that lane might be. It might just be your block, it might be a civic organization, but find your lane and be active. Again, we all need to thrive. Thriving individuals create thriving communities. So it takes all of us. Health equity equals a healthy community. Um, we're all in this together. I know that sounds like something you heard when things weren't feeling too good, but we're all in this together, and we all need to thrive, and we need all of you to help us with that. So with that, I have questions, but I don't know if we're opening up for questions. Are we? OK. I can take any questions that anyone has. Yes? Yeah, so um, when we identify a home that has elevated lead levels, um, we work with the Department of Development. And depending on the level of um, lead in the child, as well as what we find in the home, there are resources to help the, the landlord do remediation. The work that we are talking about with replacing windows and doors, this would only be if we find lead. This is not going to be available for just efficiency or energy efficiency, but they would be replaced with newer windows that would be much more energy efficient than what they have today. Yes, in the back there. Is that income based? Right, so the way it works right now, the funding that we get through development, it is income based. Um, and so we that's one of the reasons why we want to raise funds because we know there are some people who might not qualify based on their income, but they could benefit from the resources. And so yes, um, the Department of Development does have some federal funds and some state funds that are restricted based on income. A question over here, she's coming with the mic. I have a question about the actual lead testing. Um, you mentioned that you know nobody likes to get their blood drawn, especially children. So, is it um, like a test, like a glucose test, that you get immediate results, or is it a test that has to be sent away and get results? So there's two kinds of tests. So the test that is preferred is a, a venous test, where we have to draw blood from your vein, and then we do need to send it to a lab to um, get um, the numbers. But there is a test like a glucose stick on your finger. Um, if it comes back elevated, we would need to verify that with a venous test. That would take a few days. So there, there's both. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention is we also, and this is where the education and outreach comes in, we're also going to be going into those three neighborhoods, and we're going to offer to screen your home. In advance of identifying a child, if you're willing, if you want us to come in, we have this, I shouldn't call it a gun, we have this device um, that allows you to test to see if there's lead in the paint. And so that's another aspect. When I said testing and screening, I didn't mention that. But if you go to Luke's breakout session, he's going to talk about that a little bit more. But yeah, so if you do the fingerprint test, you do get those results pretty quickly. Um, but it has to be verified with the venous test. I guess the uh, federal government infrastructure uh, bill that went through allocated $15 billion for the removal of lead pipes coming in the house. How much of that money will Columbus get and where will they allocate that money? I'm in an older neighborhood. Will they be coming in, in older neighborhoods and taking out the lead pipes that's coming into the home? Yeah, so that's a great question. I can't speak to the specifics about how much money Columbus got and how we're utilizing it, but I can tell you that we are working with um, our Department of um, Service? Public Utilities, thank you. Public Utilities, um, and they are going to identify 
These, they're working in these same three neighborhoods that we are initially, and they're going to expand out to identify um, neighbors, neighborhoods where they do want to replace the service line to the home. But they will need the homeowner's permission to get in there. So we do have, and that is completely covered, not by not any homeowner's expense. So that will be rolling out soon with the um, Department of Public Utilities. One more question. Last one. Hi. With so many children um, having ADHD, and it's apparent, it seems like it's an overwhelming amount of children these days with ADHD. Are those children tested automatically once they are discovered to have ADHD, since this seems to be playing a, could play a large role in that? So we do have a, a, a high number of children who are being diagnosed with ADHD. Some of that is because we are better at diagnosing it and looking for the signs and symptoms. In terms of is that a knee-jerk reaction for a provider to do a lead test on that child? Not necessarily. Um, that's why we need to do the education and outreach because we need parents to ask, like, have you tested my child for lead? Can you test them for lead? Um, that's something that a parent should be knowledgeable about and should be able to ask their provider. So. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate being with you this morning. I hope you learned something from um, my talk this morning, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. Take care. Let's give her one more round of applause. I had to take a moment. I'm like, I'm thinking of so many things, so many questions. I learned so much. I knew about some of those issues and topics, but we really delved deep into that, and I learned a lot. Well, thank you, Dr. Roberts, for those insightful remarks. Please join me. Um, each year, we have the opportunity to announce the recipient of the Dan Charles Award. The Dan Charles Award is named after longtime and respected Southside resident Dan Charles. His leadership was demonstrated by his strong vision, deep engagement, and desire for a transformative community. Dan created the Southside Community Action Network. He was a proud resident of the Southside and helped others to learn more about their community and each other. He was a very humble man with a huge heart. The Dan Charles Award recognizes individuals based on their roles as leaders, their engagement of diverse stakeholders, and their vision for a transformative community. This year, we are recognizing a visionary leader who is creating long-term solutions and a better future for his community. He has created the only Bhutanese and Nepali-speaking community center that serves as a one-stop shop for the Bhutanese and Nepalese who struggle with language, employment, and housing. The following quote from his nomination letter exemplifies why they were selected to receive this award. It reads, he is a positive force for good in his community and in Columbus in general. He is a well-respected young leader who is on a mission to do great things and achieve great results for the Bhutanese Nepali community of Columbus. Please join me now in recognizing Sudarshan Pakarol the winner of the 2023 Dan Charles Award. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit. It is now time for everyone to visit the resource tables and go to your first breakout session that will start at 1020 AM. You can learn more about each session, the speakers, and the location of each session in your program. And remember, we will return here at 1230 for lunch. We gave you breakfast. Now you're going to have lunch. And we'll also recognize these young people sitting in front of us.
Welcome back. It is now time for our 20 Under 20 Award. Here's what we look for when creating this special list of young people. The 20 Under 20 Award honors outstanding young people who contribute to their communities through exemplary acts of volunteerism and, in, and advocacy. Parents, FYI, these names are in no particular order. They are all equally talented and impressive. <laughs> And recipients, when your name is called, please come to the stage, listen to your bio, and then go across the stage to receive your award and take pictures. Now I will be joined by my director and assistant director, Carla William Scott and Julia Carter. We start with Molly Tangor. Molly is homeschooled and is in the ninth grade. Molly has been an inspirational and hardworking leader in the New Albany branch of the Columbus Metropolitan Library. She has worked with small children to help them learn how to read, help run large scale events, perform for youth story times, and maintain library collection materials. She has served 229 hours since June of 2023. <laughs> Danny DeWeese attends Hilliard Davison High School and is in the 12th grade. Danny goes above and beyond daily for her school and community. She's a leader on the Hope Squad and has been recognized at the state level of Grant Us Hope for her work in spreading kindness and awareness of suicide prevention within her community. Trijana Bastola attends The Ohio State University and is a freshman. <laughs> Shrijana organized a youth and refugee mental health conference. The event provided a platform discussions on mental health, especially among youth and refugees. She engaged with partners and stakeholders across her community to make this conference not only a one-time event, but an annual event. Desmond Hunter attended South High School and graduated this year. <laughs> Desmond has tremendously benefited the Southside community through volunteer service at the library. As a library intern, he consistently improved processes and re was respected by staff and customers. He helped with free snack distribution, the summer reading programs, and family programs. Ecom Judge attends Licking Heights Middle School and is in the eighth grade. Acom. Acom Judge attends Licking High School Middle School and is in the eighth grade. Ecom has used what she is learning in her honors and AP courses to support younger students in the Licking Heights Middle School Help Center. She is consistently available to support younger students with their homework. Michelle Morrison attends Lyndon McKinley STEM Academy and is in the eighth grade. <laughs> ninth, <laughs> ninth grade. Michelle helped to uplift the community by volunteering at the library where she signed patrons up for the summer reading challenge, helped care for baby chicks, what? that's cool, <laughs> served lunch and snacks and assisted with cleaning and summer programming. Cedric Ira Sabisa attends East Linden Elementary School and is our youngest recipient. He's in the second grade. <laughs> Cedric's family arrived from Rwanda as refugees. Cedric assists both his mother and his father with interpreting and supports an art program where he helps make clay and do projects with Congolese and Rwandan women through Chris's health and wellness program. Right. 
Onayechi Saunders, or Chi-Chi, attends Bishop Reedy High School and is in the 12th grade. Chi-Chi interns at the library where she uses her problem-solving skills to complete complex research assignments, assists with inventory management, and comes up with creative solutions to unexpected issues. Her supervisor, supervisors noted her maturity and insight is typically associated with someone much older. Magnolia McMillan, Leah for short, attends Pass Innovation Lab and is an 11th grader. Leah is a prolific inventor, artist, and innovator. As a participant in the Ohio Invention Convention, she has advanced to the national competition not once, but twice. She is an intern <laughs> at the Pass Foundation and at a local urban farm where she helped engineer a 3D printed puppet show to model quantum effects for elementary school students. She is a published author and playwright and has had her play performed on stage at MADLAB. Yes. <laughs> Kaliana Song attends Columbus Preparatory and is in the 11th grade. Kaliana is a volunteer at Hilltop Early Learning Center where she assists during the end of day pickup by greeting families and answering questions about enrollment and center operations. She keeps the food pantry at the center organized and stocked and help preschool teachers prepare their lessons by gathering materials and prepping activities. Oh, yeah. Aditi Packerel attends Rennellburg High School and is in the 10th grade. Through her participation with 4-H, she brought diversity to a traditionally non-diverse organization and helped new members thrive. She has helped to increase awareness about the Bhutanese immigrant community to in Central Ohio and volunteered at her local library to support summer reading programs. <laughs> LaShawn Breckenridge attends Valor and is in the ninth grade. LaShawn has volunteered with over 120 hours at the library. She is a leader among her peers and a consistent helper with the Reading Buddies program that helps school-aged children develop their reading skills. <laughs> Madeline Thompson attends Reynoldsburg High School and is in the 12th grade. Madeline has utilized her knowledge of STEM to boost her robotics team's nonprofit outreach initiatives, including the Refugee and Immigrant STEM Experience, or RISE, with Columbus Refugee and Immigrant Services and Step Ahead Tech to host seminars for youth. <laughs> Tia Ward attends Centennial High School <laughs> and is in the 12th grade. Tia is a violinist who shares her gift with the community by playing at social events. She helps to bring a smile to the faces of those most in need of comfort and joy by playing for nursing home residents at the hospital. Jasmine Davis has a very long one. Jasmine Davis attends Columbus School for Girls. She is in the fifth grade and is our second youngest recipient. <laughs> Jasmine uses her voice to show that young girls have a place in Central Ohio. She has written and delivered original speeches as Little Miss Black Ohio Junior and for the groundbreaking of the new Dream Big STEM Center and Makerspace the Dr. Martin Luther King Oratorical Contest, Girls on the Run International, National Council of Negro Women, Incorporated, Columbus Chapter of Give That Girl the Mike Talent Show, Commission on Black, Grounds, <laughs> Black Girls Crown Act Story Event, and the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus State of the Black Family Keynote, just to name a few. <laughs> I need to revamp my resume. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Alec Boyd attends the Columbus Academy. It is in the 11th grade. 
Alec organizes activities and community service events on a monthly basis as president of Jack and Jill Columbus Senior Teens Columbus Chapter. She led in the development of the Senior Teens yearly strategic initiatives that are designed to positively impact the lives of African American communities. Khadija Yassin attends Columbus Alternative High School and is in the 11th grade. Khadija has a strong passion for helping others by empowering them to reach their best quality of life through a focus on mental health, team suicide prevention, and social justice. Khadija volunteers at Faith Mission, the YWCA Family Center, and Mid-Ohio Food Bank. Dexter Jones attends Worthington Kilbourne High School and is a 12th grader. Dexter reignited a neighborhood 4th of July float building tradition by fundraising and organizing adults to come together to build a float for the Worthington Hills 4th of July parade. He is a swim coach for the Worthington Wave swim team and a captain of the Worthington Kilbourne water polo and swim teams. And that concludes our list. Let's give them all another huge round of applause. <laughs> all recipients, please come up for a group picture. And that concludes our 2023 Neighborhood Best Practices Conference. We hope you took away valuable and relevant information for your community as you continue to empower your neighborhoods. Remember, it takes a village, and we are stronger together. Thank you for attending, and drive home safely.